Welcome to a brand new series where we will explore the origin of the Ether concept and look at how this concept has developed over time and how this could offer an alternative to our understanding of light and other electromagnetic phenomena, as well as gravity. We have previously covered the idea of gravity ether in the gravity series, and here we will explore the light ether. But we must start our journey at the beginning by exploring the very first mention of the word ether in a scientific context. In order to start our journey, we need to look back at the original concept of light. The earliest ideas of light can be traced back to the Greeks. Aristotle used the term matter in a very different way to the way we use it today. His word for matter meant something out of which something else could be made by imposing on it a further condition or structural principle called form. Ordinary bodies, he thought, were made up of four elements, fire, air, water and earth. He believed that each could be transmuted into the other, and therefore were only different forms associated with some sort of prime matter, which was itself inaccessible to experience. When we examine their initial concept of light, they defined it with a metaphysical notion of potency and act. A transparent body has a potency for transmitting light, but it does not become actually transparent until the light is passed through it and thereby brings the transparency into action. The next advancement in the idea of the universe and what light is would take nearly 2,000 years and were made by René Descartes. The age which preceded the birth of Descartes and that in which he lived was marked by events which greatly altered the prevalent conception of the world. The discovery of America, the circumnavigation of the globe, the invention of the telescope and the overthrowing of the Earth-centric view of the universe. One of the problems of natural philosophy was to account for the actions transmitted between bodies not in contact with each other, like for example magnets, the moon and the tides. Descartes rejected that these were caused by the occult influences and instead thought that they must be explained through simple mechanical things like pressure and impact. This immediately means that all objects must somehow be connected to each other. He rejected action at a distance. And this also meant that the space between the Earth and the Moon could not be empty. Indeed, the whole of space could not be void. He viewed that this space was occupied with normal matter and also that the whole of the rest of the space must be filled with particles of a much more subtle kind, which were in constant contact with each other. Space, in Descartes' view, was a plenum, being occupied by a medium which, though imperceptible to senses, is capable of transmitting force and exerting effects on material bodies immersed in it, the ether. Now, the ether had originally meant blue sky of the upper air and had been borrowed from the Greek by Latin writers from whom it was passed into French and English in the Middle Ages. Descartes was the first to bring the term ether into science. In his view, it was to be regarded as the main constituents of the universe, save for the infinitesimal fraction of space which is occupied by ordinary matter. Now that is probably something that sounds familiar. Descartes viewed that the ether particles were constantly in motion. As space was completely filled with these particles, it would mean that the movement of a single particle of ether would need to involve the motion of an entire closed chain of particles. The movement of these closed chains constituted vortices, which he felt performed important functions in his picture of the cosmos. Descartes was the originator of the mechanical philosophy, but he believed that it was not necessary to match theory with observational evidence and experiment. Huygens directly criticized Descartes for exactly this, saying of Descartes, he puts forward his conjectures as verities almost as if they could be proved by his affirming them as an oath. He ought to have presented his system of physics as an attempt to show what might be anticipated as probable in this science, when no principles but those of mechanics were admitted. This would indeed have been praiseworthy. The many defects of Descartes' method led to the rejection of almost all his theories in less than a century. But let's run through what his Cartesian philosophy was. Matter in the Cartesian philosophy is characterized not by impenetrability 
or any quality recognisable by the senses, but simply by what he termed extension. Extension constitutes matter, and matter constitutes space. The basis of all things is a primitive, elementary, unique type of matter, boundless in extent and infinitely divisible. In the process of the evolution of the universe, three distinct forms of matter have originated. These are the luminous matter of the sun, the transparent matter of interplanetary space and the dense opaque matter of the earth. He believed that the luminous matter of stars had been scraped off the other particles of matter when they were rounded. They moved at incredible speeds which means that when they meet other bodies, it is with such a force that this causes the objects to be broken up into smaller pieces that are so numerous that they fill all the holes and the small spaces which exist around these bodies. The matter of interplanetary space constitutes most of the rest of matter. The particles are spherical and are very small compared with the bodies we see on Earth. Descartes viewed that they did, however, have a finite magnitude. The final type of matter is the dense opaque matter we are more familiar with. These are much larger and heavier and are not moved as easily as the other two types. According to Descartes, the sun is the centre of an immense vortex formed of the first or subtlest kind of matter. The vehicle of light is the second kind of matter, composed of a closely packed assemblage, globules. These particles of the first and the second type are constantly straining away from the centre around which they turn, owing to the centrifugal force of the vortices. This means that the particles are pressed in contact with each other and tend to move outwards. It is the transmission of this pressure which constitutes light in Descartes' view. This means that the action of light extends on all sides of the sun and stars and travels instantly to any distance. Descartes supposed that the diversity of the colour of light was due to the different ways in which matter moves. In particular, he thought the rotation rate directly related to the colour of light, with those that rotate the most rapidly being red and the slowest blue. The idea that colour was related to some aspect of the periodic time is an interesting foreshadowing of a great discovery that was not established until much later. As crude as Descartes' theory was, it did encompass a wide variety of phenomena and stimulated the spirit of inquiry and in some degree prepared the way for the more accurate theories that would come later. The next noteworthy event in the theory of light came from Robert Hooke, and this is what we will cover in the next episode. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.